Now, Deluxe Man posted a challenge where he said that you should go to any Raw or SmackDown from 2002 to 2008 and just do a review on it. Notice, uh, well, not to do a review on it, just to watch the whole thing front and back from the beginning to end. And notice how it's more interesting and keeps you interested a lot more, a lot more invested, a lot more entertained than Raw and SmackDown of today, where the product has shitty booking, shitty presentation, shitty production, shitty writing, and it's not as much a talent thing. Although, yeah, there is... Talent is a thing that is involved in why it sucks, though. But there's just so much stuff that proves that these shows were better in the past. And that's essentially what he says. So I decided I'm going to watch it on my own. I'm going to do a review of SmackDown every Thursday and Raw every Monday of the past. So it's sort of like a retro review thing. And afterwards, you can look it up on YouTube and see it for yourself. So the first one, a random one I chose, was from September 25 of 2003, and it's SmackDown. Right after a pay-per-view. And I gotta say, it was really fucking good. Really fucking good. And the only reason I'm saying it's really fucking good is because I can obviously tell that this was a slow night. It was after, less than a week after a pay-per-view. And I'm sure that they were just, like, recovering from that climax. Everything felt like it was just going back to business. After a pay-per-view, it's back to business. Yet, even with that said, it, it was still a really good... It starts off with Vince McMahon and Sable walking into the ring and they're like presenting the title to Brock Lesnar because he beat Kurt Angle in a fucking Iron Man match. They were fighting for like 60 minutes and eventually Brock Lesnar won on and I mean, he was going to like Vince is saying that this guy's the next big thing. I'm so glad that he won. He did such a good job. He's the future of this company. In comes Kurt Angle. And Kurt Angle shows up and... I gotta say, he's he's pissed as hell. He's like, where's Brock? This nigga took my title. He was playing cheaply. He hit me with the steel chair. He cheated on numerous occasions. Where the fuck is this asshole? So he's waiting. He's like, I'm going to wait for this motherfucker Brock to show up so I can fight him. Then John Cena's music hits in and he shows up. And John Cena tries to do this rap on Kurt Angle, but Kurt Angle jumps on him. He says that uh, Kurt Angle was pissed because he lost the title and now he has a vagina. Uh, horrible paraphrasing, of course. However, Kurt Angle proceeds to beat the living shit out of John Cena. And then John Cena takes off. He like walks. He like runs out. This is an interesting thing for me. Kurt then says, "You know what? If Lesnar isn't gonna show up, then I'm coming to him." So he leaves. And this is a paradigm shift from the go home show of WrestleMania of that year, where John Cena did the same thing after his match with Rikishi. He said, "You know what? If Lesnar isn't gonna come to me in the ring, I'm gonna go to him." So he stood well with like run backstage and what happens? They get jumped. In this case, Kurt Angle goes into Brock Lesnar's room, doesn't see him. And as he leaves, John Cena jumps him and then takes off. <laughs> I just thought it was like a really good opening segment. And they show you what happens in a commercial break. What happens is fucking... John Cena is running out, and he runs into, he goes into the car and drives away uh, outside, and Kurt Angle is limping to Vince's car, and he's like, the chauffeur, I think, is like, dude, that's Vince's car, what the fuck are you doing? And Kurt Angle's like, I don't give a fuck, man, I, I'm gotta find John Cena. And of course, it's all like, 
setting up to their match at No Mercy, where I, where Kurt Angle wins. But of course, there, there you go. That was a good ass opening segment. And then what do we get after that? We get Los Guerreros versus Matt Hardy and Shannon Moore. An awesome ass cruiserweight. Yeah, two awesome ass cruiserweights and um, Latino Heat. You gotta, you gotta have respect for that shit. Good ass fucking match. Different than the tag team matches we get now, where the tag team matches we get now are like watered down. And the spots are easy to tell. It's just, it's just a bunch of spots. No real in ring action that's worth a damn. Here we don't get the predictable spots. We get to see some chaotic ass wrestling where they don't just stay in their corner just cause uh just cause they didn't get the tag. They like they get involved a lot. And there isn't that predictable thing where the high flyers like, jump on the fucking guys when they fall outside. No, none of that shit. I mean, there's stuff like it, but all in all, it's some good-ass fucking work. How does this end? Well... Los Guerreros keep their titles, but... Matt Hardy fucks... Because, yeah, they win. But Matt Hardy fucks them up, so... It's like... Yeah, they kept the tag team titles, but Eddie Guerrero fucks. Eddie Guerrero gets fucked up by Matt Hardy, and after he gets fucked up by Matt Hardy, Charlie Hass or Charlie Hayes shows up, and he fucking obliterates Eddie Guerrero to get some injured and shit. I can't say the names, but all in all, good fucking match. Nice camera angles. I like the difference between. How all the spots are today and how it was back then. More creativity. Now going to the minus point. Uh, we're treated to A-Train. and he In this case, A-Train... That character is different from Tensai in the sense that A-Train can actually talk. A-Train's character actually speaks. He's not great on the mic, but he's a lot better than I thought. He's got this Philly accent, and he shows shows up on a ring. He's knocking everything out. He knocks the fucking steel steps. I'm fucking up a lot of shit. And he's like, why can't anybody t admit that I can beat Chris Benoit? And then he does a cross face on one of the cameramen or bell guys Benoit shows up tries to get involved tries to stop a train from attacking this nigga and in turn Benoit gets fucked up so here a train actually does have a role as a character he's not just I mean he, he was never that fucking involved as a character well, I'm not gonna answer the fucking phone, damn. Shit is like drilling a hole into my fucking brain. But anyway, that was fucking that was that was good. Not as good as everything else, but if you think about it, imagine a no career, no chance guy like A Train cutting a promo now. Let's say uh Right back. Vladimir Kozlov, Great Call Lead. They would fucking suck, but this guy is actually okay. more time. This nigga calls me one more time. I'm gonna show him who's boss. I'm gonna like bitch him out in front of this video. While you're watching this, bitch him out on the phone. 
or her. Doesn't matter. All right, next segment we get Tajiri versus Rey Mysterio. Rey beat Tajiri for the cruiserweight belt, and now Tajiri turned heel, and he's gonna like try to get it back. This is less of a comic relief side on Tajiri, and I gotta say this match is really good. It kind of shows that when Rey Mysterio is facing other cruiserweights, people judge him a lot less. I mean, people really fucking hate it when four feet tall guys are beating niggas like Kane. That pisses people off because this is a cognitive distance. Like, how can it happen? And again, it's not like Rey Mysterio is Kevin Shamrock or Ken Shamrock. It's not like he's a UFC guy. It's not like he's Daniel Bryan where Daniel Bryan knows a little MMA. Where he knows shit like that to defend himself. So he's got real fighting background shit. Or CM Punk that I think he knows a little Taekwondo Jiu-Jitsu. Now this guy's just a complete masked wrestler, high flyer guy. But here, this is a good fucking fight because they're cruiserweights, but there's a contrast in their style. It's not like one guy's a high flyer versus another high flyer. It's not Evan Bourne versus Sin Cara, which was a good match. Though. But here, these guys, there's things about them that are creative. They have a contrast in style. They're not cruiserweight stereotypes you got the mass wrestler and you got the Japanese style wrestler where he does all those little green mists and illegal moves and stream shit for them so Tyrejiri gets a win it was, it's a match with a lot of twists and turns after this mm -hmm. well I want to talk about I want to skip ahead to Jamie Noble and John Bradshaw Layfield versus the Basham brothers with Nydia and on JB Noble's side, her kayfabe boyfriend, and Shanika with the Basham brothers. And the Basham brothers here take a masochistic role where Shanika takes out her fucking weave and whips him with it. That is some fucked up shit. That's back when wrestling wasn't as PC. Although, that's not that but b bitch hits those niggas with their weaves and their max statistic. They love that. Nydia, of course, is like there because she's kind of in a feud with Shaniqua because Shaniqua attacked her. And Shaniqua was this big, big built black girl, all broad bone structure and shit like that. Not Karma, though. She's not like big, big, but. Her bone structure, her body, is it, she's built durable. She's built tough with broad shoulders and shit like that. Not fat. She's not fat at all. I don't want you guys to get the wrong idea. Alright, so, that, other than that, I didn't really care for this shit. I didn't really give a fuck. Alright, hold on, I'm about to do some part two shit pretty soon, so I'm about to go ahead with that. Catch me catch me in part two of this video and it's Mr. Maka 7. And next video suck my dick.